God bless you. God bless you. I just, I failed to say this a moment ago, but just a, like a little housekeeping um, issue. If you choose to give to missions, for instance, designate it on your envelope, missions, because if you don't, the, whatever you give on a weekly basis, that goes into what's called the general fund. And the general fund, we do pay our mission support with that, uh, but if you designate missions, it'll go right into the missions fund, and then if you designate, say, building fund, that will go into the building fund, which is separate from the general fund. Everything's under the general fund, but then under that there is missions, building fund, eventually be a woman's, men's, youth, children's, so on and so forth. But I just wanted to make that clear, just in case if you designate uh, on your envelope. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. It's filled with promise after promise after promise. God, we're grateful for your word, and we're grateful for you. I pray that you would add your anointing and your blessing to the reading of your holy scriptures this morning, God, and that your word would find a lodging place in our hearts that would radically move us closer to you. Lord, more of you and less of us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I want to talk to you, we're going to get into the book of Judges this morning. If you turn with me to the book of Judges, chapter 7, and I will begin reading there in verse 7, I suppose. I was going to start with 9, but we'll start with 7 in chapter 7, and then we're going to move over to Judges chapter 15 after that. So if you want to mark your thumb there, the, for the next couple of weeks I'll be teaching a series on purposed for purpose. Your purposed for a purpose. And I want to talk about focus. The word that God gave me for my life for this year is focus. And so I've been I'm praying through that and really trying to focus on the tasks that God has given me, things in my life to really kind of zero in and focus and not be so spread out because really we only have 100% to give away, right? And so if you spread that out too thin, many times you are busy but not, um, not impactful. And so we zero it in and focus um, without a broken focus, then you, I feel like I can achieve a whole lot more um, systematically that way, one, one thing at a time. Let's begin reading uh, chapter 7, verse 7. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took, over, who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. He's giving him a promise. Note the promise. He's giving him a promise. I'm giving it into your hand. I have to change this uh, slide. Well, I guess we could just turn that off. I don't have a slide this morning. He's, he, so he made him a promise. I'm going to give Midian into your hands. And then he goes on to say in verse 10, If you are afraid to go down to the camp with your servant, uh, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, I don't know if I'm saying that right, we'll call him Pura, his servant went down to the outposts of the camp. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley, the enemies of God, thick as locusts. There were many, 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 many. And you have to remember, Gideon has 300 men at this time, just 300. Thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. Gideon arrived just as the man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley, a loaf of barley, bread, came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, This can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream, 
and the interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. Purposed with a purpose. I, this is an important message uh, this morning. I feel strongly about it. I have been praying about this particular topic of vision, purpose, destiny. I love to talk about it. I think it's important. It's key in our life. And that, you know, God, uh, just in this story alone, and we're going to go through some other stories as the weeks go on, but Gideon was given a promise. But that promise for Gideon was not enough. He was a fearful guy. He was kind of, his faith was wavering some. And so God makes the statement here that um, in verse 10, if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura. But prior to that, he told Gideon, go up, go down to the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. He told him specifically, I'm going to give you the camp of the enemy, you are going to overtake the Midianites and all that are in that land. I'm giving that to you. He made him a promise. But for Gideon, the promise wasn't enough. That promise was not enough for him. The promises of God, sometimes, church family, that God gives us are not always, and I say all they, always or all the time, self-fulfilling. Sometimes they are. But we need to go a step further. The promise was not enough for him. The children, look, look at this, the children of Israel were promised, right? They had the promise of the promised land, but didn't step into the, so into the promised land. So they were filled with promise, God-given promise, but didn't go inhabit the promise. And so you need to know that a promise is a revelation of God's divine intentions in your life. Amen. A promise from God in His Word, when you pick up this book, in your Bible, it's filled with hundreds and thousands of promises for you. God's intention, God's divine intentions for your life are right here. Not all of them, however, are self-fulfilling. God will show you in Scripture what His divine will and divine intention is for your life. But then what are you going to do about it? Amen? What are you going to do about it? The key to make, the, the key for me is, and I, this is really what I wanted to teach you this morning, is to turn the promise into a picture. To turn, go from promise to picture. Yesterday I was here with Ken and we were doing some work around the church and Ken got all the emergency lights done. I don't know if you guys noticed, the new emergency lights are done, the exit lights are all done, the uh, wiring's all set upstairs in the attics. Thank God for Ken. While we were down there, we heard a little chirping. This is a side note. Downstairs in the, for the, uh, uh, the sump pump, it was chirping. So I went and looked. And lo and behold, I'm glad it chirped because the line was broken where it pumped the water out. So we ran up to Lowe's, bought the parts to fix it. We fixed it. But I was talking to Ken about turning... Uh, I didn't, I didn't want to give it away yesterday, but I was talking to him about turning the promise into a picture. That you, you have to be able to see what God's plan is for your life. When I preach to you, when I preach, I, I try real hard to paint pictures for you so that you can see it in your mind. Because if you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. To see that which, the things that are unseen, the Bible says, are eternal. The things which are seen are temporary or temporal. And so, if he, if he gives you a picture uh, of victory over your situation, you will head toward that picture. So here's what happened with Gideon. He overheard, God said, go on down. If you don't, if you don't believe me, in other words... If you're afraid to attack, if you don't believe that I'm going to give you the Midianites into your hands, if you're afraid to attack, go down and listen to what they're saying. He goes down into the enemy's camp. He overhears a conversation. He's eavesdropping on the conversation. The one man's telling the other man that, hey, there's this loaf of bread, this loaf of barley bread, a round loaf that rolls down into the camp. And that loaf took out the tents and completely wiped them out. The revelation of that dream from the other man was, hey, that must be the sword of Gideon coming against the Midianites. So now, all of a sudden, Gideon had a picture. He had the promise. 
But it wasn't enough until he got the picture of the promise. That's what vision is. Without vision, my people perish. You have to have a vision. It's like a, uh, you cast off restraints without vision. I have to have a vision for our church. I have to have it. I have a vision for our church. When, when this whole thing started uh, several months ago, God quickly showed me a vision of being your pastor, and, and, I had to, and God gave me a picture of what was to come. And as we go, he unfolds that and unravels it. And that, that picture, uh, that promises that God was giving me became a picture in my mind. Now we look around and we're seeing the fulfillment of the promises, and we see some of the things that were just part of a small part of a big vision for the church. They're coming to pass. You have to have a vision for your family, a vision for your life, a vision for your children, for your grandchildren. Capture that in God. He's going to give you the promises, but let God take it a step further and develop a picture in your mind, and then you will have a vision for victory. Amen. He overheard the enemy was saying, you're going to wipe out the enemy. God had already told him, but he didn't believe him. And, and until he got the picture, and then look at this key scripture, down in verse 15. When Gideon heard the dream and the interpretation, when he got the picture, the Bible says he bowed down and worshipped. He worshipped. Once the picture was revealed to him, he began to worship God. He wasn't worshiping prior to that in the promise. He didn't drop down and bow down in worship just with the promise alone. But when that promise became a picture and his divine destiny was shown to him in his mind, in his heart, by way of a dream and interpretation of that dream, he began to worship and say, thank God, this is for real. This is really going to happen. You know God is able to do exceedingly abundantly over all that you can think or imagine. You know that he's a big, big God. And he, you know, I don't believe that we will possess the promise of God until we can see the promise of God. You have to capture it. God made us visual people. He made us very visual people. I often say, and I've heard it be, uh, be said, that more is caught than taught. That you're, we're visual people. I've had discussions about this with Scott in regards to uh, you know, video and, 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 and capturing pictures and, and doing video clips and stuff because more is caught. We live in a visual society, right? We really do. And uh, like, like if I tell you horse, if I say horse to you, you get a picture of a horse in your mind, right? If I say zebra... You get a picture of a striped horse, a zebra in your mind. No matter what, if I were to say polka dot in your mind, you say po if I say cow, you have a picture of a cow in your mind. We're visual people. And so when God gives us a dream, God gives us a vision. If you can like, get it on your face before the Lord and he turns that promise into a picture, in your mind and in your heart, you will begin to see that which is unseen by the naked eye on the inside of you. And once you see it on the inside of you, it will come to pass on the outside of you. You have to have the vision on the inside first. When he got a picture, he responded. He worshipped. What changed? He got a picture of the future. He saw it. Before he ha it happened, he saw it before he stepped into it. And Abraham, God told him, you're going to be the father of many nations. He said, you're going to have children. He said, here, I'm going to give you a day vision. Look at the, sea, look at the sand on the seashore. You're going to have children, as many as that sand on the seashore. The number is going to be uncountable. Then I'll give you a night vision. Look into the stars and look at the starry hosts. And look up there, and you're gonna, your descendants will be as many as the stars in the sky. He showed him the picture before it became a reality. And I'm praying that God will give you a picture of the promises of God for your life. Picture of the promises of God 
for our fellowship. Picture of the promises of God for our church, for Pembroke. How we can, how can we uh, uh, reach into the city in the in the in, in the um, in the South Shore area and impact the city and impact the area with the gospel for the glory of Jesus Christ. We must have a picture of that first. It's important if you can see the invisible. You can do the impossible. A picture away from the performance is a, is a way for the performance of the promise to take place. If you can capture the invisible in your mind, you can do the impossible. You get the promise from the word. You don't see it at first for yourself. You know, we sometimes struggle with, with doubt, with self-doubt. You know, I don't think I can accomplish this. I, don't, I think it's too late for me. My children are gone too far. My grandbabies are too far. And we have this kind of self-doubting uh, sometimes, not all the time, but we have a tendency to do that because our mind is at war with God. I'm a nobody. I'm a failure. This is never going to happen. And we drift that way from time to time. And God wants you clearly to have a picture of victory in your life, for your life for your children, for your grandchildren, for your future. God has a blessing for you. He really does. You have to believe it. On your tiptoes. It's tiptoe time in expectation that God really does keep His promises to us. He's a promise-keeping God. You have to get before the Lord and get the picture of your destiny. You're not a failure. You're not a nobody. He will turn that picture and it, he will turn it into a picture in your mind and it will radically change your life. It will. Turn with me over to Judges chapter 15. And this is where we're going to camp out. We're going to go back to Judges chapter 7 next week. But I want to talk to you for a few moments about Samson. We said a moment ago that without vision, we perish. Without a vision, we cast off restraint. We have to be able to see with our eyes closed. Right? To be able to see with our eyes closed. Judges 15 and verse 1 says, Later on, at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. He said, I'm going to my wife's room, but her father would not let him go in. I was sure that you hated her, he said, that I gave her to your companion. One translation says that he gave, this father gave this Samson's wife to his best friend. Gave, it, gave her away to his companion. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. Verse 3, Samson said to them, this time, I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really, really harm them. That moment, right there, that moment for Samson, and many of us know the story of Samson. He was a man of great strength under the anointing of God. He wasn't, uh, I think months ago, I touched on him uh, in, a, in one of our services. But Samson wasn't a... Uh, a, a big man. He wasn't like, like Arnold. He wasn't like Franco or The Rock, modern day rock. He wasn't that at all. And the reason why I know that, and we should know that, is because um, as you read through the 15th and 16th chapter there of Judges, you will see that, his, that Delilah, once she comes into play, uh, she continually asked him the secret of his great strength. What is the secret of your great strength? What is the secret of your great strength? And Samson deceived her. He didn't give her the full truth. He told her this and he told her that. And, and she kept pressing on him, kept pushing on him until finally she, uh, he gave in. He got tired. The Bible says he was mad in his, in his heart, in his head from her continually pushing and pressing on him. And, and he told her that the secret is, I'm, I'm a Nazarite. I took a Nazarite vow. The secret of my strength is in my hair. So she would not have continued to ask him what the secret source of his power was if he was a big guy. 
No. She would have already known. She would have known. No wonder this guy can take one jawbone of a donkey and destroy so many people. He's big. He's huge. It makes perfect sense that he's a, he's a fighting man. And, 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 and he's like, he's, he's uh, the Terminator. And so, of course, he's going to be good at fighting. But so Samson, he, uh, he starts out well. If you know a little bit about Samson, you know that um, angel, an angel appeared to his mother and his father and told them that he was going to be born. And so there was no doubt that Samson was called of God. There was no doubt that Samson had an anointing of God on his life. He was to take the Nazarite vow. He was to keep his hair uh, long, that he was to take touch no dead thing, to have no drink, no fermented drink. You know, he had a vision. He had purpose. He was born into it. He strived for it. He continued in that way. And this moment in the 15th chapter of the book of Judges changes the course of his destiny forever. He knew that he wasn't supposed to associate with Philistine women. He knew that he wasn't supposed to link up with them, that uneven yoke that we talk about. An uneven yoke will, you know, if, you, if you're yoked, the oxen are yoked, and many of you probably have saw this kind of demonstrated in the past, but a, a yoke of oxen, if, if, if you have one big oxen and one small oxen and you're yoked, you're going to be yanking one another back and forth and there's no unity, there's no rhythm. And really what they say is you have a tendency, one, uh, one big and one small uh, oxen, you end up going in a circle. Round and round we go. Where you stop, nobody knows, because you're unevenly yoked. And Samson knew that that was not supposed to be part of the plan for him. Instead, he marries a Philistine woman. He, had a, he took a liking to Philistine women. It was his downfall. So he has this woman, and he comes back, and the dad of the wife gave her away to his friend. At that moment, we read in the third verse, this time I have the right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. He began to burn with rage, began to burn with anger. He, would, he, he was filled with bitterness, resentment, all the things that we kind of talked about last Wednesday and Thursday morning here at the church. And he got totally distracted. His focus was broken at that point. The vision for his life, I call it broken focus. At that moment, his focus was broken. No longer could he see clearly because he was in so much pain. No wonder could he uh, run toward the vision that God had promised for his life because he was so filled with anger. And everywhere he went, he tried to take out as many Philistines as he could. He went from vision to division. Division. So he went from vision, fully anointed of God, an angel appeared to his parents, vision to division. And he began to make bad choices. He had broken focus. Bitterness entered in. After his father-in-law gave his Philistine wife to his best friend, and past pain began to conduct present business in his life. You can't let past pain make contemporary decisions for you today. You can't. You have to somehow get on your face before God and, and receive the healing. By the way, day 15 today of our fast and prayer is a focus on faith for healing. Isaiah 53 says, by his stripes, we are healed. Amen. We are healed. And so past pain in your life, past issues in your life can only be healed by God. You know, I, I have counseled many young people over the course of time. And I would tell the woman, the, the young girl, the man, if, he would, if the boy that she liked was prone to anger. I would say, be careful, honey. Be careful, Don't, uh, you probably want to rethink marrying him. Sometimes you have to just be blunt. 
Or if the man, the young man, had a girl that he liked that was a head snapping, finger popping, angry girl, I would tell him, be careful, you might want to slow down because you're taking on something that can only be healed by God. Amen. And God is able to go into our past and heal up our past, secure our today and anchor our tomorrow, and He does it all at the same time. He is more than able. But Samson went from vision to division, and his past pain began to make present decisions for him. Anger burned on him. And he, Samson also had another issue at this time. He had what's called a wandering eye. He had a wandering eye. He was always looking. He, was all, he, he wasn't focused any longer. The task at hand was definitely interrupted by his love for Philistine women and his hatred toward the Philistine people. It was a weird dynamic. He loved Philistine women, but he couldn't stand. He was angry at the Philistine people. And so he was double-minded. His vision was broken. A wandering eye. He was always going after prostitutes and violent out, outbreaks and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he had the attitude, Samson almost had the attitude, if I can get into the mind of Samson, that he could handle this. You know, he's not totally focused on the, the task at hand anymore. His focus is broken, but he kept playing with it. He kept playing almost like, I can handle this. And guess what? Sin, when it's full grown, it gives birth to death. You can't play with sin. You can't play with it and not expect to get burnt. You can't play with it and not expect for it to get its fangs in you and all of a sudden it brings forth death. That doesn't end well, friend. You can't play with sin in your life. You can't handle it. And the Philistines, the enemy, knew his weakness was women. So they hired, basically hired, a Philistine woman to go in and find out the secret to his great strength. And he continued to play with sin, continued to play with it. And if, you know, we teach our kids, if you touch the fire, don't play with the fire. You're going to get burned, right? You're going to get burned. Don't touch that. That's hot. Be careful on the stovetop. It's hot. You're going to get burnt. And many times our little ones, they have to put their hand up there anyways and touch it just to see for themselves. Right? We're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We have an innate built-in ability to drift towards sin. We need the grace and the mercy of God in our life. God's presence, His Spirit will lead us and guide us into all truth. We need His Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to saturate us, to wash us from the top to the soles of our feet because we have a built-in hankering for sin. There's a tug-of-war going on and God has to grab hold of the rope and pull. And so... If you read through the 16th chapter of the book of Judges, and I apologize for jumping around a little bit this morning, but I have a point that I'm going to make here in a moment. Four times she asked him, what was the source of his power? What was the source of your power? What is it, Samson? How are you able to do what, you, what normal men cannot do? And we know that it was the anointing of God on his life. It was the presence of God. You know, when the presence of God comes on you, you can do things, you know, you might not be qualified to the natural eye, but you can do things that nobody thought you could do. You'll do things that you didn't think you could do. When God's presence comes on your life, he will give you the ability, the kiss from God, will give you the mind, the skills to get the job done. And you'll look back and go, wow, I can't believe I did that. God is able. God wants to do that for you and for me. You know, us plus God gives us the majority. When it doesn't look like it, when it looks like more are against us than for us, us plus God, all of a sudden, them are uneven odds. 
because He is on our side. And if God is for us, who can be against us? No weapon formed against us will prosper, nor will it be able to stand. You will do, you really will do exceedingly, abundantly more than you could hope or imagine or think in your heart. God is able. I have a beautiful picture of you. I have a beautiful picture. God has taken promises and built them into a picture for me for our church. It's a vision. Without it, we'll perish. You have to have a vision. You can only, like for me, there's no neutral gear in the kingdom of, of heaven. You're either going forward or you're going backward. And if you don't have a fresh vision, and what we do sometimes, God will give you a promise. God will lay somebody on your heart. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a son, a daughter. They finally get their breakthrough because God is the God of breakthroughs. Can you say amen? You finally get their breakthrough, and you get to that place, and you go, made it. I made it. And pretty soon you're turning blue because you forgot to breathe again. I made it. But at some point, you got to take in, right? you got to take in the breath of God and get a new vision, a new destiny, a new part of the purpose for your life that's attached to your life. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man that which God has in store for you, for our church, for your family, for you as an individual. You guys believe me? Amen. I'm glad you do. I'm glad. I just had to check. I wasn't sure. But he had, he, uh, Samson at this point, four times was asked, um, what is the secret source of your power? We already went over the fact that he couldn't have been a big guy. He finally shares his secret. And the Bible says that in verse 15 of the 16th chapter, then she said to him, how can you say I love you? when you won't confide in me. You know that you share your secret, the secrets of your heart, with what you love. Right? You share the secrets of your heart with whom you love, with what you love. And that's exactly what triggered him to finally go, man, I, I, I've, I've told her everything, I was, I was deceitful, to her, I was deceiving her, and finally, after I believe after he heard that, wait, I do love her. It was more than just uh, him having an affair with her. He loved Delilah, over, blinded by it, over and over again, knowing that she was setting him up for failure. But when you love something, love someone, you will give your secrets to that which you love. That's why it's important that we're careful about what we attach ourselves to and the desires of our heart remain pure in the eyes of God because you will share that which, uh, which you love with, you will share the vision, the dream, the purpose of your life with the wrong people. Guess what? Joseph shared the dream for his life with his brothers. Not everybody's going to embrace your dream. Not everybody's going to embrace the vision for your life, the purpose for your life. We have to kind of be careful who we share them with. And make sure you don't get unevenly yoked with people around you because you'll end up going in circles. You know the destiny is that way and you can't stop going round and round and round because now you're sharing your heart with the desires of your heart with people that don't have your best interest at heart, that really don't, have, don't want to embrace your dream. They might have ulterior motives. We, I caution you, to be mindful who you share your dream with, who you share your, the hopes and the promises of God in your life with. He went from having a full vision to having die vision. Diverted attention. Double-minded men are unstable in all of their ways. He was definitely unstable. And then, 
the end of this matter certainly wasn't better than the beginning. He ended up going from full vision to die vision to no vision at all. Blinded by sin, blinded by the desire for the wrong thing, blinded by anger, blinded by bitterness, blinded by resentment, blinded, and then that was spiritually blind, then it become physical blindness for him. They gouged his eyes out. They gouged out this powerful, anointed Nazarite. They gouged out his eyes, and he lost his ability to see in the natural. But the ability to see in the natural was taken away after he lost the vision on the inside. That's the point I want to get through to you. That you have to have a good, clear, holy vision for your life on the inside or you risk losing your purpose. We are purposed for a purpose. You have to see it first. The promise has to become a picture, and the picture has to be run after. The book of Habakkuk says, write the vision down. Make it plain. Make it so plain, in fact, on tablets that if a herald was to run with it, with this written down tablet, that people would be able to read it. It's that clear. Make it plain, make it clear. Capture a vision, a fresh vision for your life in 2020. It's not by mistake that I'm teaching this in the middle of January. It's the beginning of a new season, the beginning of a new year for us. It's the beginning of first full year of us being together. We need to capture a fresh vision for our church, for our family, for our loved ones in 2020. God will unfold it. He will paint pictures for us. You'll see, at one point, you'll be standing in the middle of that which was only a promise. Go, wow, look what the Lord has done. It's going to happen. It's going to happen for you. It's going to happen for me. It's going to happen for our church. God finishes that which He starts. He who has begun a good work in us will see it through to completion, the Bible says. Read it for yourself in Philippians, the first chapter. He will see it through to completion. But we can't abort the process. We have to stay fixed and focused on God. In a world that's full of distractions, distractions here and distractions there, and we're up against it here, to be able to see clearly the promise, the picture of God in the midst of that is the chore. That is the challenge. But God, the Holy Spirit, will give you vision. Be careful not to allow it to become die vision. Because if you do, you'll lose your vision. And without a vision, people perish. They will perish. We have to have a clear vision in front of us. You as a family man, you as a family woman, for your life, for your children, for their children and us as a church family. Amen. A clear vision for our church going forward 2020 and beyond. And beyond and beyond and beyond and beyond. I was talking to Tommy yesterday. He came up and we went and got the stuff at Lowe's and he, he brought a truck up. We were able to go do that. And he was talking about, we want to make the church better for future generations. For future generations, what we do now is going to impact the future and the future after that. To have a vision that goes way beyond the here and the now. To look through the eyes of God into the future for this fellowship, for this church, for us as a Christian community. Eye hasn't seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into our hearts that which God has in store for us. I'm going to keep saying it. I believe it. God has given me a big vision, a big picture. I can see it with my eyes closed. In Jesus' name, it will come to pass. So eventually he told her that um, the secret was in his, his hair. 
and she shaved his secret. She shaved the secret right off. She cut it right off. Because that what you love, you share your heart with. You got to make sure you're not, you're not, I'm going to keep saying it. I think we need to hear it again. Be careful who you share that with. And it cost him. And he ended up blind. They cut his hair and his eyes were gouged out. His strength came from God. Your strength comes from God. Our strength comes from God. Let the weak say, I am strong. And in the power of His might, His mighty power at work in us, if He's for us, who can be against us? God is at work in your life. The source of your strength, the source of your power in your life is from God. Amen. We can't get it twisted. The blessing of the Lord empowers us. And if there's anything that we need to be, that we need to, to hold on to, is being and becoming more of a Spirit-empowered church. Empowered by the Spirit of God. We have lots of gifts Lots of talents here in our little fellowship. It's amazing. The gift, the skill set, the, the talents that we have here. But that is not enough to have the strength of your own hands. We need God's touch on that which we do here going forward. We have to see the invisible so that we can do the impossible. And the Bible says that he went from... So, no, of, of having full vision to die vision to having no vision and then the end of this really is better than the beginning because the Bible says that Samson took more people out in his death than he did in his life. He has this little boy. They have this little slave boy, this Philistine little boy. They have him all chained up now. He was this mighty man of valor, this Nazarite set apart. An angel talked to his family about him being born. His eyes are gouged out, blood streaming down his cheeks. Defeated. Defeated. And this little uh, boy, this little lad, brings him out all chained up and he says to him, he says to the little lad, lean me up against these pillars. Put me up against these pillars and, and, and because I want to be able to stand upright. And the little boy did it. He brought him up there. But what was going on in Samson's life was that his hair began to grow back. The Bible says his hair began to grow again. The secret source of his power. He went from having vision to die vision to no vision to envision. He then could envision him pushing the pillars down and collapsing the temple on his enemy. He went from vision to division to no vision. And then God touched him again. His hair began to grow back. It's never too late in God. It's never over until God says it's over. His hair began to grow back. And they put him up against those columns, those pillars. And he pressed on them. And the Bible says that the building fell down and collapsed on the enemy. And more people were taken out in that moment than in his entire life. But... He died too soon. He died too soon. You know, Joseph and Samson are a great comparison. Joseph was also called of God. He had the dream. We talked about it a moment ago. Just alluded to it. He had the dream. He shared his dream. He ended up being elevated. He got thrown into a pit and then made it to the palace, back into prison, back to the palace, and a famine was in the land, and he then was used as a deliverer of his family and uh, the children of Israel, ultimately. He was a great type, biblical typology of Christ. But over and over again, he was able to resist Potiphar's wife. 
over and over again, when she came and made uh, advancements towards him, he was able to resist that which she enticed him with. Because things in the world will entice you. It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. You will be enticed. The temptation will come. But in every temptation, God provides a way of escape. Flee from it. Run from it. Don't get yoked up with that. And so Joseph said, no, time and time again. Look at Judges, and I'm going to close with this. I want to say that you're going to recover it all. We are going to recover it all. How about that for a word from the Lord for 2020? We're going to recover it all. Recover it all. Everything restored. The devil's given back sevenfold. If the thief be found out, he's meant to repay seven times. That which was stolen from you last year and the year before and the year before, the thief has been found out. We're going to bind him up. He's going to repay you seven times. God's blessing will overtake your life in 2020. I declare it to be so. Let it be. Look at the first, I'm going to close with this one verse. Judges chapter 16, verse 1. One day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute and he went in and spent the night with her. Read through Genesis verse after verse after verse. Joseph was able to resist Potiphar's wife time after time after time. Verse after verse, chapter after chapter. Samson couldn't make it through one verse. He couldn't make it through one verse. There went Samson into Gaza, saw their harlot, and went in unto her. Both were called of God. Both had the anointing of God on their life. Both had a destiny attached to their life. Both men were destined for greatness. One become a shadow of the church and a type of Christ. The other died too soon. What was the difference? Not the anointing. Not the presence of God. Personal, inner, spiritual strength. Integrity. Character. Not linking up with that which could potentially kill you, hurt you, harm you, throw you off course from the destiny that God has in store for you, for us. God wants us to recover it all, whatever that all is in your life, family, careers, finances, so on and so forth. He wants to give you back you have to let the promise become a picture in your mind. Write it down. Make it plain. Process and pray over that and run with that vision into 2020. And God will bless your socks off. I believe it. Test Him and see. Test Him and see. Let's pray. God, I thank You for this morning. Thank you for this important message that the Holy Spirit gave to us today, God. That without a vision, we will perish. God will cast off restraint. I pray, Lord, that us as a church family, as a body of believers, we would just develop a solid, rock-solid, clear vision for this new year. And that, God, we will run toward that vision with a clear mind, a clear heart, with good, clear vision, not be diverted, God, to not lose our sight on that which is important, that which you have in store for us. And I pray for us as families, that each individual family here, God, that each one would recapture the promises that you have made them. And that, God, you will make those promises pictures in their hearts and in their minds. 
Lord, I, I'm, I recall even when I was raising up my children, I would say things like, what do you want me to do? Draw a picture for you? You don't understand? Do I need to draw you a picture? God, I believe that that's what you're doing for us now. When we don't understand how it's all going to work out, when we don't get it, how it's all going to play out, God, draw us a picture like you did Gideon. Because down in our hearts, many of us are fearful, even though we hear the voice of God. Even though we heard the promises of God. We get afraid to step out of the boat. We get afraid of the wind and the waves. I pray, Lord, that you would draw a picture, etch it on our hearts, where you would have us to go, where you would have us to be in 2020. We need to see it before we can step into it, God. Help us to see it. See it clearly, emphatically, and powerfully. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen and amen. amen. God bless you.